metrics. I suggest we uh, get started. Welcome everybody. Uh, there's a couple of chairs uh, empty still on this side. If ever, if ever anybody would like to move a bit closer or over here, you're super welcome to do that. So welcome to our first ever ETY lunchtime session. It's a small group, but it's a historical moment. <laughs> um, my name is Bart van Helke. I'm a director of the research uh, department. Um, and I'm really uh, delighted, actually, to um, sort of re revamp um, the regular series of discussions um, on important topics for the European uh, trade union movement for the uh, ETY. Um, what we do, of course, is not entirely new. Nothing ever is, apparently. You know, many of you know, especially Philippe Pochet knows that previously the ETY had uh, monthly forums uh, to which many of you uh, attended. Uh, and in a way, of course, what we do here is a uh, continuation of that. Um, and I know we had uh, the person who organized all these monthly forums with us, uh, Marianne Colombo, yesterday as well. So the idea is that we regularly gather around uh, good sandwiches and um, nice desserts. Uh, the citron meringue is always for me, just so that you know. <laughs> you have another one. We have, there's another one there, yes, thank you. <laughs> Seems a detail, but it's not. So we have regular ex exchanges, uh, as informal as possible, and the idea is really to expand uh, our horizon of our core expertise at the ETO. We cover many topics, we cover many issues, but not everything, of course. And so, um, these uh, lunchtime sessions will really be there to, to expand our horizon. And today, in a very, almost in a very literal way, and we're going to be looking at uh, South Asia, Australia, um, uh, which is a little bit of a stretch for uh, most of you, and, and including poor me, myself. So that's what we want to do. Um, I can already uh, flag that one of the uh, next lunchtime sessions will be about the far right uh, in Europe. Um, a topic that is, again, very relevant, of course, for the European trade union movement, uh, but which is not on our <clears throat> research agenda, at least uh, at this stage. So that's the kind of topics that we will be uh, dealing with. In the European so I'm very happy today to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Stéphane uh, Lequeux. Bienvenue, uh, Stéphane. Um, so Stéphane is, uh, is visiting us from uh, Australia, James Cook um, University. Uh, and during the past 30 years or something, I think, uh, you've been working and you've examined uh, trade unions, uh, evolving employment relations in many parts of uh, the world, including uh, Canada, Europe, Southeast Asia, and indeed uh, Australia, where I think you uh, work and uh, live. So Stefan's uh, scholarship, and don't worry, Stefan, I won't go into all the details because it's uh, explained in detail in the invitation, but your scholarship has been about solidarity, uh, social justice, uh, and more recently also uh, environmental uh, policies. Now, what some of you may not know is that at some point in Stefan's life, he was a researcher at the ETY. So in a way, it's also uh, squaring the circle. Welcome back, uh, Stefan. Um, and uh, of course, you've also been an active supporter and contributor to the, the Massey University um, uh, people, organization, work, and employment research hub, and easier in its abbreviation, and power. Um, and I believe that uh, this hub, which is in fact a, a, a transnational research network, that you are co chairing this with Shane Parker, uh, research, um, senior researcher at the ETY. So we'll be talking today, or in fact, Stefan will be talking today uh, about labor, labor regimes and industrial relations in the Asia uh, Pacific, um, which is a bit of a stretch for us. Um, at, and I think at the same time, uh, we agree uh, that this is really an important topic. Uh, we know that um, uh, we have increasing workplace globalization in terms of the physical and virtual locations of production service workplaces, and of course, uh, in terms of the surging cross-national labor uh, migration. 
whether uh, we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, Europe's workplaces uh, and labor regimes are fully intertwined with other regions uh, and countries in the world. And they have important uh, consequences uh, for the organization, for the strategy and the agenda of trade unions. And that's also why I'm very happy uh, that uh, my friend Klaus Mikael Schell is here with us uh, today and Jay will properly introduce him in a moment. Uh, I know you have a beating heart for research, Klaus Mikael, mm -hmm. and so very happy mm -hmm. that you could uh, accept our invitation. So we'll hear about uh, specificities and commonalities of labor regimes in Australia, uh, Vietnam, Singapore, and of course what this means for the European project so that you know we can also recognize some of our own uh, thinking in that. Um, and I just wanted to thank Maria Nikolova for or organizing this <laughs> and she uh, left that. So uh, Jane, I'll uh, hand it over to you now. As I said, Jane is a senior researcher at uh, the ETUI. Um, and for the rest of this meeting, I'll just be listening and enjoying the sandwiches, and especially the citron meringue. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, over to you. Thank you very much. And demarcation is duly noted. Um, welcome, everybody, to the first. Can I just, does everybody hear us properly here? Yeah. Is that yes. okay? Yeah. 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 And if it's not the case, you can move in closer. There are a few chairs uh, available. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Maria, now you're back. Thank you again for all your sterling work. <laughs> not many people are thanking you, but then realized. But uh, it's great to see everybody here and also online. Um, thank you very much for coming to this inaugural session of the lunchtime sessions that we're looking to establish, as Bart said. Um, I'm delighted to be to have my close colleague, uh, Dr. Stefan Lecoeur here with us. Um, he's uh, away from Australia for five weeks or so, I believe, and um, we're one of his important pit stops on, on route to other fabulous places as well. Um, apart from last night when we went out for dinner, Stefan and his partner May, who's also with us today, um, uh, we, we caught up about a year ago, I think, at what was the uh, Association of Industrial Relations Academics of Australia and New Zealand. We like the long titles down under, apparently, or ARANS, and it was their 2023 conference. And I have to say, it was uh, located on the enchantingly entitled island of Magnetic Island. Philippe, were you there? Yeah, I believe you were. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous location, also where you live, I believe, yeah. uh, Stefan. And um, right. Stefan did a sterling job in pulling that together. Uh, you know, against some odds, I might say, because of the logistics and the locational challenges. So that was fantastic. So we're with someone who has much experience in that sphere as well. Um, today, Stefan's going to be um, focusing on a comparative inquiry, as Bart just said. And I think that this goes to the heart of some of our concerns here in Europe as well, around labor regimes and industrial relations. And it's important all, for all of us in the room, be, be we workers, uh, members of trade unions, and members of society more generally. Stefan, I believe you're going to be speaking for about up to 25 minutes or so. Yep. Okay. And then we're delighted to, again, welcome uh, Klaus Mikael Ashtal, who is the Deputy General Secretary of the European <laughs> Trade Union Federation, the ETUC. <laughs> And um, Klaus Mikael will be giving us about 10 minutes as a discussant where he'll provide feedback and other information based on Stefan's talk. So welcome to you both. And um, we'll then conclude the session by opening up the floor for questions to those of you in the room and also those of you who might be online. I would just say at this point that we will be recording the session as well. So it'll be a very nice resource which we'll make publicly available on one of the ETUI websites or something like that. And again, thanks in advance to Maria, who is our IT whiz, for helping out with that. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Stefan, who will be uh, taking the lunchtime session on its first voyage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. And uh, thank you all to, for welcoming me here, having me here. So just before I start, uh, and we have 25 minutes, we're going to keep that in mind because there's some folk here. I, um, yeah, I, I contacted James and said, well, you know, I can do something on Australia, I can do something on Singapore, and also Vietnam, these three areas I'm working in. And she said, oh, hmm, do something on, can you do something on Australia, Singapore, and Vietnam? <laughs> 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 and I never thought of, of doing that, and, and I'm thankful for this, it's great idea. <laughs> but it was a challenge, and I tried to, say, so to, to get to a comparative level of like you see the title, it's contrasted regimes. It's the, when you Singapore, Vietnam, and Australia have much to see each other, you know? 
so at what level of analysis we can um, uh, grasp um, the three uh, contexts. And so that's, I knew that that would be kind of a friendly audience. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was thinking, well, let, let's go for it. It's off my hat, you know, and it's tentative, but um, uh, we'll see how it goes. Huh? Okay, so from there, you will. Doesn't work. Yeah, this one. No, uh, on, on the right hand. You need this one. No. Um, all right. Um, so before starting, uh, you, you need to know that, um, of course, um, well, obviously, Australia is my turf, my background, my backyard. Um, Singapore, I've been doing research in Singapore for 15 years. I uh, had interviews with the um, uh, trading leaders, uh, the LTUC, uh, the Ministry of Manpower, and things like that. Um, so I know firsthand uh, Vietnam, I'm relying on my colleague uh, Anne Fox from the University of Wollongong. She's going there basically every year. She's from uh, Vietnam originally. So, but we've been working together for 20 years. Uh, and myself, I'm scrutinizing the uh, label. It's just that that's similar data for me that you know so I know less so about Vietnam than I do about Australia and Singapore. <clears throat> so you will excuse me if I don't I can't go into the details. So I will provide background of each country and what is my research agenda, what I what I think should be the research agenda in each country. We'll go fast. You know, we've got 20 minutes, 25 minutes. <laughs> So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna pinpoint uh, what is important, and I trust that you can read after, you, I think you, you're gonna have the hard copies of, of the, the poor computation right after the session, so you can read by yourself. I was just like, well, that's what, this is what is important, but you know, the rest you can read. You know? uh, and then uh, we'll get into the, um, the comparative perspective. And as I told you, try to find a level of analysis, what I call, root analysis, and if you fancy, you call it ontological level, but not a theory, um, and, and try to, to look at what the system is about uh, as a way to, to, to be able to do this comparison. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, thanks to Chen as well, so, hey, you have to have something European there. So trying to reflect back on, well, what can we learn from that and, and what does it mean for us? So that's it. So Australia, uh, well, uh, we have at the moment a sluggish growth yeah, just because of the monetary policy to kill inflation, which is killing us, especially middle class and working class. Uh, and and uh, but this this turbulent, uh, the is still like we're still on interest rate for uh, four point seventy five something like that. So um, unemployment has been rising a bit because of that, but still reasonable for four person. It's a high income country. It's high cost country. That is going from one pocket to another. <laughs> uh, particip participation rate is fairly good. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what we've seen, and I'll come back to it, uh, to this, is, is fragmentation mm -hmm. of, of the labor market and uh, 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 steady rise of casualization. Uh, union membership, well, we're down to 12.5. We'll, we'll have the next uh, census very soon at the end of the year. Uh, I can bet that it's going to. Be stable, uh, not growing. And um, uh, well, like everywhere, full time employees and part, uh, public sector are more likely to be unionized than the private sector. And you know, uh, same story than everywhere. Uh, we, um, not so long ago, membership, union membership, um, or union density used to be uh, close to 50%. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Thanks to the old liberal policies. Uh, and that's what is. Oh, oh sorry. Can you faster than me? Sensitive. It's very sensitive. Yeah. That's the storyline. So the storyline of Australia is uh, for the last 25 years at least uh, um, about decollectivization, deregulation. Uh, mostly under the liberal agenda, but people are maybe misled, if you know the history, um, big reforms were made by Labour before, like the introduction of enterprise bargaining, just being a mess, uh, never worked in Australia. 
uh, was from labor. <coughs> uh, internationalization, the opening of stress, what that was in labor in the 80s. Uh, we, we had the liberals and conservative um, uh, it's a coalition coming in in 1996, and that, that has been a liberal agenda all the way. And we've some episodes of uh, an episode of liberalism where they try to rebalance the system. And the word there is very important to rebalance the system. New Zealand has been a bit the same, but more radical. They have been in a raw cluster, you know. Um, so it's, it's almost the same story, right? So this is what you, you have to remember. So, and this is what the Labour government is trying to do right now. Uh, but for the last two years they have been elected, it's just trying to uh, put the piece together a bit. Um, so you can read uh, uh, Greg and Jim, Jim and for this Canadian election. Uh, this paper that, or Bouchard that has just been published, and we did basically the same with um, the usual suspect, John and David, uh, in French. Uh, so the key word there in Australia is fair. Uh, the ideology is all about the fair go. It's a lot of it. has a long history. So that you can have a decent life uh, if you work, um, you make it in life. It has to, the system has to be fair. But so I think of the French like um, it's not about it's nothing about revendication and rah rah. It's good. no nothing about struggle. So it has to be fair. You know? Um, keep that a bit behind, you know, it's just we don't have any social movement. There's no radical left. Uh, they, they was in the past, it's gone. Uh, so then you see the, the, the legislation is the framework act that was, was put, put by the previous Labour government. Uh, the tribunals have been renamed the Fair Work Commission. It's all about fairness. Mm -hmm. So what we, we got with the Liberals, well, I'll go fast, and the wish that stagnation a decade of no real wage increase. Uh, the labor market is totally fragmented, uh, which doesn't help uh, union the organ, organ, uh, recruitment. Uh, an erosion of status means that uh, having a good job with um, uh, rights and things like that, it's much more the exception than the rule now. And um, uh, it has been, the, the whole thing has been following the UK in terms of putting the emphasis on individual rights uh, to the extent of, or to the expense of collective uh, rights. I'm going to go faster than that. So in Australia, a good way to see who is covered, who is not covered, um, I'm talking about collective coverage, is looking at the method of pay. And you'll see that now collective, um, uh, you, you can add here, um, Basically, um, uh, collective coverage can add the awards with collective agreements, uh, but still it's half of the population. Um, it used to be not over 90%. Uh, you see the impact of the liberal policies. More than 90% of the of, uh, Australian workers were um, on the collective agreements or awards with the designs. Mm. All right, so. <clears throat> What, what, what is the situation? Union decline, but you have to see that unions have been working in a contrary world. Uh, they have been under attack uh, for the last 25 years, and they still there. You know, they are resilient. Uh, more and more uh, feminization, we, we've got more women now in the union, uh, women that men. Problem is to, to get the, the youth, like here, yeah, to get the youth in and to get migrants to join. Uh, but so organizing is still is very important. The big worry we have is that employers have so much to lose that they, they did not play the game anymore. And they don't see the need to play the game anymore. And that's a big worry because it's the legitimacy of the system that is on the threat. Uh, enterprise bargaining introduced that was introduced in the mid uh, 1990s never worked in Australia because the system was about the tribunal. So it was about advocacy, not bargaining. And we took um, enterprise bargaining from North America, but we got, we got the key element that makes it work, uh, like good faith bargaining and, and having time for bargaining and so forth. So employers have been gaining the system, just work. And it's not a mentality. And for unions, and you know, in practice, but I've been getting it for a long time, uh, no resources, uh, no training about how to bargain, uh, and so forth. And there's a lot of restrictions around 
but the, the right to strike, which that doesn't make it easy. So bargaining doesn't work. So what we we what, what's happening? Uh, is it just we we back to the old system? Right. We back to the system back to the tribunals. Uh, you, you need to do, for example, that in Australia, um, any strike that hurts or hurts the economy or hurts a third party is straight illegal. You need to go to tribunal. Obligation of nature. So we, we always back with square one. Um, that's that. Uh, so there has been an assessment, a mean assessment of um, what the Labour government uh, has been doing since uh, elected May 2022. Uh, the strategy of the Labour government was to go step by step, baby step, baby step, baby step back. It has been successful so far. And the second thing that they've done uh, is to uh, address um, issues concerning the working class, and especially uh, um, the living wage, and, and also other issues around uh, social protection and so forth. Um, I have to say they, they've done a good job so far. Well, I think they're going to be reelected. Um, so you, you can, uh, they, there has been a good paper from the future of work. This is a good reference. What I did is I tried to get you key website and reference that you can navigate for by yourself. Uh, so what they say, my colleagues, um, they say, well, it has been an act of rebalancing the system. It's just, you see the storyline there about Australia it's trying to get back to something a bit more uh, balanced. Uh, problem we have is really um, that the system as is really in favor of, of employers, and we need to, to, to find something around collective bargaining. <clears throat> it's, it's there. So, how to restore the balance in the system? Uh, we're going to see what Labour are going to do if we're elected. Um, I don't think they would have a radical agenda, they're going to pull the same strategy. Uh, we need multi employer bargaining. We clearly need that if we want to save collective bargaining and ever the employees association agree with that and support this. Uh, and uh, well, there's all the thing about transitioning to the green energy, which is a bit of um, hypocrisy in Australia because we're going to have zero, but as far as domestic emissions are concerned, but we're the first world exporter of uh, fuel. fuel. Fossil fuels, <laughs> um, you know, um, gas, coal, et cetera, et cetera. We just opened um, a new mine near, near my place. It's just um, the, the biggest coal mine in the world, just opened. Now, they made some that was for ours, no, just that we export it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Singapore, you, you, you know, that's the success story of Singapore. It's a pipe. High income country, fast developing. No, it's not. Yeah, it's fast developing. It's a really highly developed country. Uh, small population, relatively. Um, and um, uh, what is interesting there, look at the employment rate resident. So, what is the story light, uh, storyline in Singapore? Is um, It's an ultra corporate system. You know, uh, and uh, the PAP, the people are, are, are actually party who built Singapore and been, you know, has been there since independence, is coming from the unions. And, and they, they, they are, um, there is a symbiotic relationship between the this part, political party and the trade unions from the start. Uh, the employers were welcoming into tripartism tra uh, in the 80s only. It's a union thing. Singapore is, has been built by the unions. People tend to forget it. Okay? Uh, then you see that, I like this quote, that you all find a cow in Singapore. They've got nothing. They just have labor. They have no resources whatsoever. So all is about labor. So industrial relations is central to Singapore. And um, um, manpower, as you call it, is, is the key. That's the locus of Singapore. Uh, so then, well, the story within that, um, uh, corporatism, but which is all focused on nation building. Right? 
So they're all social partners in a very strong way. Uh, it's all about productivity and demographics. They rely so much on migrant workers. So an important right resident, you can put a split between the Singaporean and the migrants. So they, the, the, the feeling that like I've been talking to so many people at the high level of politics there is how can we get rid of uh, as many migrants as we can because of uh, social cohesion, because of also congestion in, on, on uh, Singapore, which is a, a small island. So the only way is to increase labor productivity so we don't need them. Uh, or less. Unfortunately, as one of Peter Warren was saying, uh, just uh, they still they still on steroids. You know, multinational corporations are on steroids with migrants. Uh, so it's the whole thing is about how to increase labor productivity so that to decrease the reliance on migrant workers and uh, keep social cohesion. They they're afraid of conflict. They, they, they conflict avoidance like to the roof. Uh, so it's what we call soft authoritarian paternalism. Uh, and and um, uh, as I, to, I told you, the, the unions and uh, the PAP, that's the same thing. Well, we call them the proper type men. They've got three ads. They are the government, they, they, they are in the unions, and they also are on proper type um, uh, bodies of cables that we can call association. They, they change their habit. So it's very hard to be. Disagreeing with yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very agile as a system because what, once a decision is made about whatever policy, you know, industrial policy, it's just whoosh, mm -hmm. it's going through. It's quick and agile. Um, so here, that's you will see that that's um, to give you an idea, uh, the market workforce has doubled from 2000 is still increasing. It's almost, uh, um, now I think it's 45% of the workforce. Uh -huh. yeah. Which is not incorporated into the system. No. It's a double standard. Uh, the the, um, the um, government is pressing the unions to do something, because they have been for for first time uh, in 2012, they had a, a strike from both drivers who were actually Chinese migrants. And they, and they freaked out. <laughs> well, it's first strike in 30 years. Uh, and it was a white strike as well. Uh, and and um, uh, But then what you have to remember, remember when you look at it, sorry, I'm speaking a bit too fast, um, it is you've got two categories of fast there. The migration is also of high level migrants, uh, high, high qualified migrants, uh, global talents. So, You've got both hands. You now you you got the guys for construction, construction industries and uh, and work for the steel councils and, and you've got all those engineers and you know high level um, uh, intellectuals coming from all over the world to live in Singapore. So you've got different paths there, but it's just not like in you know other countries like cheap labor. You've got you've got cheap labor and you've got the other side of the spectrum. I still remember. And for us at university, it's a problem because our students, we have campus in Singapore, are in competition with the world. It's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Europeans want to get their kids to have the European, oh, they have the Asian experience and safe. <laughs> so let, let that for you to, um, if you're interested in uh, human capital development. So all the, the uh, initiatives that have been taken by the Singaporean government to uh, enhance human capital, so human productivity, you know, uh, they've been very, very active in, into that. So you just need to click on those and you will find all the information you want. As I said, so <clears throat> the ambivalence of labor productivity is that it's a way to curb uh, the dependency on, on, on migrant work, uh, labor. And also, um, they, 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 they're very active in going up the, the value chain. Uh, that's the point. And it's, as I just said, it's a lot of pressure on the young generation, a bit like South Korea and countries like that. The pressure on the youth is immense. Uh, uh, the pressure on education. Right? 
I can feel that they, they, they must be on top of the world. And I'm just like, no, the youth is just, uh, you can, <laughs> my, my wife knows it, it just, it, it's really under pressure for being successful. Um, Say, so what would be the research agenda there? Well, looking at the dualization of the labor market and, uh, and the impact on it. Then uh, uh, everything about conflict, because people have in mind, oh, there's no, not been any strike for a long time in, just one actually. Um, there's no conflict. No, that's untrue. I would go, we, we could come back to uh, uh, Hollywood's conflict at work. But, but just manifestation of conflict is different. The way it's dealt with is different. Uh, it's an irony because you look at it, it's a hyper collective system, but the conflict is dealt, dealt with individually. Um, also, well, the challenge of human capital. Um, and well, the system has been. You know, uh, very tight for a long time. Uh, and it does create um, some form of tourism and wandering at, um, and um, to which extent they, uh, um, they can keep a tight uh, grasp or grip on, on, on the system uh, over time. Or well, they've been doing so for the last 50 years, so they, they don't want to do it. <laughs> but, you know, uh, looking at this, and especially how this system is very tight knit can incorporate our Chinese capital, especially for Hong Kong, there's a lot of things coming in, and also alien uh, influence, you know, uh, they're very uncomfortable with that. They're very uncomfortable with alien influence. Alien, that's us. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so Vietnam, I have to be, go faster. So Vietnam is, has been reforming like China since the dawn uh, in the uh, mid 80s. And, and um, well, it's kind of a success story, but still largely uh, reliant on cheap labor. Uh, and um, it is getting better and better, but um, they, they're lagging behind. Um, those are the references from my colleague, from myself, in English and French, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, well, here I decided to just look at the labor. Um, side of it. Uh, there have been, have been reforms in the 1990s, and reform was mostly to uh, empower unions. Uh, basically, tell the unions, oh, you have to do more jobs there. Um, and that was about this, and, and especially um, um, uh, also to, to, to let uh, Vietnamese trade unions, but to open the Vietnamese trade union to other uh, unions in the world, and for then trying to tell them to do more of the job on the ground. Uh, that was the um, 1990s. Uh, yet you need to remember that they have to be subordinate to the Vietnamese Communist Party, the strong hand. Uh, the the Communist, uh, uh, Vietnamese Party wants to have harmonious relations. So that's been harmonious relationships. Um, no, IR, uh, harmonious IR. Means not right. <laughs> um, you, and and uh, it's all about the same thing in, in Asia or Southeast Asia. Unions are there for pacification, right? so to curve militancy. You know? uh, yes, uh, uh, that's, you know, they are mostly an instrument of control for the state. You know? uh, they lack financial resources, uh, and, and they and also collective bargaining doesn't mean much because everything is is in the loop. Uh, and provide uh, provides in detail all the conditions that uh, employ employees have to be dealt with. But the problem is that then, like in China, the Chinese labor law it, it, it's quite impressive, but it's it's not enforced. It's on paper, but then um, and a lot of restriction on the right to strike uh, is there. But uh, it's like Australia; you, you can't. It's too difficult to strike, you know. Oh, Jane, can I tell you about that? But yet, uh, Vietnam is the country that is the most conflict ridden in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and um, uh, to the extent to which that's the country is uh, in turmoil, you know, uh, it has been for 15 years or more. Mm -hmm. And all those strikes, 100% of strikes, are illegal. And they're all led by, because they are all led by unofficial representatives. And my, my colleague Anne is doing has been doing research on those guys for a long time. You know, um, 
Unofficial, you mean migrants? Or... No, no, unofficial, that um, the, a, a strike should be led by uh, an official representative of the union. Yeah. No, they, they just, uh, from the ground, organically, you know, just like, like, they... like self-elected leaders, they are not... Official. Yeah, they don't, and actually they, the underground leaders, oh. because if they could, <laughs> they, 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 they might be in trouble, you know? And that's, that's the point that I'm going to, to that after, is that you want to make visa, you want to get make visible what is working invisibly. Now, what is on the ground uh, has to become legal. And that step doesn't happen. Uh, and I explain why it doesn't happen. So <clears throat> if you look at the strikes, mostly in multinational comp companies, including Europeans, but mostly uh, in the textile industry with Taiwanese and Korean employers, and they, they're not that friendly to, uh, not that workers friendly, can tell you, they still have a, a corporate punishment, a total list, no? um, But usually it's very short strikes, and most of the time they win. In most of 90% of cases, and it's documented by the AO, it, they, they win. Uh, most of them are about immediate working conditions, uh, sometimes about rights, but not, more, more about in person. So, 1999, uh, 2019, sorry, I'll oh, just come back to the past. <laughs> 2019, new legislation that recognized independent uh, employee organizations. Um, so, independent from the unions. So, that basically, the, the, this legislation recognized uh, independent unionism. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> also, um, well, go back to that. Uh, it, it's also linked to the ILO conventions that have been pushed by the international community and also for, for free, trade, free trade agreements, the social clause that are attached to. <coughs> so you make your mind. Some are saying, well, that's a significant step towards industrial democracy. But I can tell you that uh, since January 2021, when the law was effective till now, it has been non zero. Zero independent employee organization. <clears throat> Sorry, tells you something. <laughs> I mean, you can make your mind. Uh, and um, they, the Vietnam has promised to the Canadians and the Europeans, they had visit uh, last, I think, last Fed, that they would ratify uh, Convention 87. It's still pending. And I think the Canadians are not happy with that. I need to meet, I need to get in touch with them. It's just, Likewise, I'd like to, to, to be in touch with uh, those guys who are from Europe who have been auditing uh, human rights uh, in Vietnam. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's not there. No. So uh, you can read why I go faster, read, read why it doesn't work, but you can see they, um, <clears throat> well, not only uh, if, they, if they got the same rights for unions, they got the same obligations for unions. So the legislation that was not allowing unions really to, to go on strike applies to those organizations. So uh, they will be in the same, with the same fact, the same uh, context. And then uh, Ill illegal strikes like going on white strike are working anyway. So why? And why exposing yourself? And they can't make the union structure. They don't, they are textile workers with uh, little education. It's a transient workforce. So it's very hard to, to get something formal structured, you know? So you can, it's all detailed there, but that's really, there are sociological uh, factors behind, including ideological factors. They, uh, they used to be organized on the ground since the, the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. in a kind of guerrilla spirit and guerrilla solidarity and thing that works very well for them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's very interesting and it has been well, de uh, well, de so it's, well defined um, in the literature of, by uh, Vietnamese themselves, sociologists in Vietnam. So, <clears throat> so what to expect? Uh, don't be too excited. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and it, it, because it's not coming from, uh, it's not coming from the grassroots. It's actually multinational corporations told the the the, uh, the, the Vietnamese government do something. It's a mess here. Right? Do something. So it's coming from capital. It's not coming from labor. Okay? 
Uh, yeah, 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 so you have to be there to understand to, to, to know things. Uh, so if you want thinking of all researchers do know what if ever it happens, we're gonna we're gonna look at them. You know, we will look at what happens, you know. I doubt that many things gonna happen very, uh, very soon, but what is very important for us, and I just maybe mentioned that is to look at the uh, the trade agreements with Europe and with North America and the extent to which it, it has an impact. <coughs> Uh, and, and that's all over the region, uh, perhaps my colleagues know about the, the region. Uh, I, I didn't, I was a bit sus at the start, but I, I, I came to realize that, yes, it, it provides some leverage, you know. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's really hard to push. It, it, it does a difference. Uh, we, well, okay, we can use it as a platform or something as a tool. Uh, so. Comparative perspective, well, thinking of um, doing comparison, first of all, you think of, oh, yeah, let, let's use this um, variety of capitalism stuff that uh, we all know, okay? Now with the LMEs and CMEs, so liberal market economies versus uh, liberal, uh, coordinated market economies. Uh, well, it doesn't help much. And then, if, if I like the Australian expression, the yeah, nah, yes, no. no. <laughs> uh, it's neither LME or uh, CME, it's in between. It's just, it's both, uh, no, it's between, in between, you know. We have elements of one and the elements of others. Uh, Singapore, well, it's both. Uh, both and it's very liberal and it's very coordinated through property and, and, and tripartite uh, management or uh, say governance. And anyway, Singapore uh, is, a, if we look at the variety of thing, it's a variety of socialism. Hmm? That book, uh, Socialism That Works the Singapore Way, and then was the head of the trade unions of the NTUC. Uh, they just twist, just twisted <laughs> socialism to fit Singapore. And it makes me think of uh, these, these a uh, very good paper, um, that what we, we call, it's just um, um, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Mm -hmm. Excellent, if you want to learn about how China works. Excellent paper. So uh, Vietnam, well, it's a, a sort of version of China. You know, like um, uh, what we call the authority capitalism. They call themselves authority capitalism when they, they, the, the Chinese people speak about the system. So it's kind of capitalism under the Chinese control. Mm. And um, well, but having said that, uh, I, I would still say that the meso level of analysis is relevant, looking at actors, the legislation, the system itself. Uh, we don't necessarily have to put it in uh, typology. In, uh, but yeah, the, I mean, the, the heuristic is relevant. So, uh, See, this is what I call the radix analysis, but this radix is put in Latin, so I want to be a bit fancy. It's <laughs> pressure. Um, so what I was thinking, well, okay, um, let's go and try to think what the systems are about. Well, if we think the UK, well, that's from the web, industrial democracy, it's about democracy, it's about voice and rights. That's the UK, right? Uh, USA, well, interest. Gomper is a Gomper was a, a trade union leader of the early 20th century. He had this for, for the union movement has one key strategy, one key word, more. What do you want? More. <laughs> that was Comberism, Gomber, you know. So it all is about the bargain, individual or collective bargain. It's all about getting the bargain. And, and you find that, like uh, if you read, read Barroway, for example, manufacturing consent, it is about Workplace contractualism. Uh, if you look at collective arguments in the, in, in the USA, uh, uh, it, it, it's about contractualism, yeah. bargain. And that guy will not have a better bargain than me. <laughs> okay, that's the way they understand collectivism. You know, everybody's got the same deal. It's about dealing. Uh, well, to the new deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Australia, I said fairness. So if you, it's all about fairness. So then, if you, both, if you think about fairness, you think about tribunals, you think about balance, justice, social justice, and that's Australia, the psyche. I mean, it's the value system behind the system. This is where I, I try to go. What a system is about. 
Marcel Gauss was saying that uh, it's a very topology. You know? uh, each economy, what, what is an economy is what we value having value. So, uh, but then it's not surprising that in the last 25 years in Australia, conflict has been about the system. The French would, 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 would be uh, amazed for that. We don't necessarily change the system. We, we, we fight, we, we struggle within the system. We're not, it's, the system is not the, the locus of fight. But this is what has been. You know, destroy the tribunals, restore the tribunals. It's uh, you know, uh, changing, changing um, uh, awards uh, and so forth. It's all about the system. And you look at industrial relations, tell you no strike, nothing. It's just, it's just uh, there. Singapore, well, it's a trade-off. And that's very important to understand. I will go further on Singapore. Uh, when, when you talk with Singaporeans, they all use this expression, it's not for me. They say, oh, we are living in a controlled democracy. Controlled democracy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not like an oxymoron for us. Mm -hmm. you know? How do you have democracy on the control? So I thought, for so that is perfectly normal. <laughs> now think about <laughs> you have to get used to it. Uh, and um, it's a social contract. So the trade-off is that you've got prosperity, um, you've got stability, uh, and then, well, means that you, uh, you, you, you accept a uh, certain degree of control, which is embedded in the system. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I can tell you honestly from the unions and from ordinary Singaporeans, they all say the same thing. They say, well, it's a bit, it's a bit tight. We'd like to have more individual freedom. But we, when we look around, you know, they look at uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and so forth, Myanmar, <laughs> they say, well, we'll do pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay. Right? Vietnam, well, it's all a matter of accommodation. They're on the path of opening, of development, but has been on that, that path for quite some time. But they still, still want to re re retain control. The Communist Party still want to retain control. And I've gone fast on uh, with the uh, appointment, but the message uh, uh, from, we, we, we quote the, the political intelligence of uh, the Vietnamese, um, <coughs> uh, Vietnamese government saying, well, we can authorize of those uh, employee organizations to thrive, so long they so long they don't they don't carry any political message right and the, the instruction to the trade unions and all the uh cad of the vietnamese parties uh, have a close watch no uh politics is us excuse me so would it be an opportune to to break at this point uh, so uh that... I, I don't i don't have much time yeah and i was going to say well, class to cal um to respond yeah, I, and then... I, i'm just there oh okay Right. Um, yeah, I've got two slides. Okay. If, if you don't mind, you just have two slides. But then maybe very quickly on this one. Okay, but right. this one, we can come back to this. It's a case example mm -hmm. of getting of, of getting uh, into that kind of uh, ontological level. Mm -hmm. But that two, that three dimensions you will find it in most uh, Asian countries: cohesion, coherence of the system, and control. Tak tak tak. That's Singapore. You know, say. So, is the name of harmony, that harmony is about nation building, community of destiny. Of uh, course, the system has to have some gravity, right? and hence, true partisan. Uh, and all the institutions are about that. Control, as I said, it's, it's a trade off, it's a contract. Right? So, if that's a, a level where you can understand the system, not going to all the detail of the system. Um, and for, well, for us, Vietnam, so um, how can we help? Now, how, how can we help? Uh, it, it, no, this thing is a trap for workers. No? But then uh, we, we could give them some leverage. Uh, but are we, are we render them any kind of service anyone? Uh, no. So we, we need to understand the ambiguity of the legislation and uh, what I know is from yeah, from Anne and others is that yes, uh, we need to have a close eyes on free, free trade agree, agreements and uh, also the ALO is making a, a pressure that uh, uh, works. Um, Malaysia, I didn't talk about it. Uh, you need to know in Malaysia that um, uh, unions are can be hostile to workers 
and especially migrant workers, which they, they see as doing uh, labor uh, dumping, social dumping, and things like that, can be very hostile to migrant workers. Uh, and, and, and like um, you know, oh, I'm mentioning that the, in the region, they can be very corrupted. Unions uh, may be very corrupted um, and uh, as an instrument of control, uh, not necessarily on the worker side, uh, which uh, is a bit of um, troubling things for us. And Singapore, well, we, you need to, know, uh, to remember that Singapore has been made of five unions. And I, I, I remember one union leader from the chemical industry, chemical pharmaceutical industry, telling me, uh, you know, foreigners, multinational corporations, um, Americans and European alike, uh, because Europeans, uh, when they're not in Europe, they tend, well, I've seen that in Australia as well, they tend to forget their social obligation and commitment. Hmm? But they play nice when they are within Europe and outside of Europe, uh, not the same case. And the guy was telling me that what they don't understand, you, you, if you confront us, you confront Singapore. We are Singapore. So welcome to the tribunal, and that's us again. And you lose 100%. That's it. So you have power, but through the institutions. So, uh, and I'll um, say so all our concepts. Individualism, collectivism, uh, democracy, conflict, um, all of that takes a different sh shade, you know? uh, and have to be understood sometimes. They don't, they understand it differently. They, um, we have to be very careful when we, we analyze the countries with all toolbox. Um, can we borrow something by Singapore? Not. Uh, this this is has grown organically uh, with special culture, special context, and actually themselves they have never believed in one single model. I call it the no, not not. Lee Kuan Yew didn't believe in any kind of of, of uh, recipe. They were very pragmatic and just doing what they were saying fit for them. That's all along the way. No? So it's never been a model anyway. Uh, Australia, I think it's going to be interesting. It's the question that it's not perhaps uh, as acute for you, but for us, can we can we rebuild some kind of socialism or social? <laughs> yeah, can, can can we come back from liberalism? You know, can we reverse back from that sh that thing? <laughs> uh, and this is what labor is trying to do. As I said, they try to rebalance all the time, and they are doing this exercise right now. Uh, trying to rebuild solidarity, trying to rebuild some social protection, trying to, to rekindle uh, the, the labor market. Not surprisingly, the, the legislation is, is, is uh, closing the loopholes. Uh, in French, if anyone speaking French, it's just a bit of like a legislation, legislation bouche trou. <laughs> They're trying to re uh, put things back together. And I think it's interesting question, uh, things to look at. It's like, will they be able, how, what works or not? You know, uh, and off my head, and then we go to, we can go to discussions. Off my head, but just me, myself, I was reflecting back and say, well, looking at Southeast Asia, especially, what is important? Well, to have a space for independent actors, yeah. uh, institutions that are packing up, embedding ind independent actors that are real actors. Uh, Political freedom and social movement also that you know uh, back up uh, those institutions and you know, or put pressure on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, right, as I put there, create power base for active participation, democracy. It's not the case in uh, a kind of movement. I think <laughs> uh, the importance of social protection. I mean, in Australia, you lose your job. Pretty much naked, no? uh, uh, being um, the, the employment system, social protection system, the pool system. Yeah. So, and, and so, this I forget about it. Uh, less so in Singapore, but all around the place, uh, there's no social protection. Dot. Full stop. No? Um, and um, in in relation to industrial relations, I mean, for us in Australia, very important to look at uh, how you, in Europe, you organize sector-based bargaining. 
And I remember for a time I was at the TUI, I was we were doing research with our Jeremy, Jeremy Wellington and others about the organization of collective bargaining. And it was obvious to us that uh, sector-based bargaining was uh, um, was um, the, the, the key level for coordination across countries. And, and we dearly miss that in Australia. Otherwise, I can predict that's the end of enterprise bargaining in Australia, uh, which never worked anyway. So that's... I, I did my job. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry, but there's a lot of content there, but you will have yes. you will have all the slides and yes. Thank you so much, Stefa. I mean a lot of food for thought there. We had breadth and we had depth and we had comparison, which is always music to the ears of industrial relations practitioners and scholars. Um, Mikhail, I don't uh, sorry, plus Mikhail, I, I don't envy you on this task. <laughs> but if you'd like to follow up, we'd be delighted to give your response. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and I, I have had the slides beforehand, oh, and, and yeah. uh, so I've had op an opportunity to, to read, uh, read on it uh, before. Uh, and, and I'm afraid I don't have an awful lot to say about things that, that concern Australia as such, or, or Vietnam as such, or Singapore as such. So what I'm going to, to focus on is pretty much the, the, the questions you ask at, at the end mm -hmm. uh, related to, and, and try to relate those things to, to Europe and to, to make the experiences that you described into a European discussion. Now. So if that's OK, uh, so don't expect any in-depth comments on anything that has to do with, 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 with the countries. But, but you, you essentially ask what we can learn and borrow from each other and, and i do think it's a lot uh, a lot to 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 learn from different corners in europe but, but also from from other parts of, of the world and, and we have these four questions that you ask here and i think that they are very important questions on on, on institutions that creates uh, some proper space for 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 social partners as we call them here in europe uh, uh, um, Secondly, uh, political freedom uh, as to make democracy happening for real in a way. Uh, and then thirdly, social protection. And I guess one could, has to discuss in that context too, whether it's something that is provided by the state or by, by trade unions or, or uh, actors, whatever you want to call them, uh, by themselves. So, so that's, which is, and fourthly, uh, uh, the, the, the importance uh, of, of an industrial relations system that is, is supported by, by, I guess, the state uh, most of the time. So just to give you a full disclosure, my background is Swedish. I'm Swedish from the, the beginning, and, and I'm still Swedish, I guess. Uh, it's my passport, <laughs> so it's and, 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 and if you come from Sweden and you've been working your whole life, as I have in, in the trade union moment, you will be very... Uh, uh, affected by by what we call the collective self-regulatory model. It is a model where, where the social partners by themselves to a great extent uh, regulate things by themselves. But it's not happening in a vacuum. Certainly not happening in a vacuum. And and and, uh, and 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 I can talk for hours, uh, believe me, on, on how this model then, then developed. Uh, but it developed essentially out of of of, of the capitalist system being uh, 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 established in, in Sweden in the 1900th century and, and the a, a regulatory vacuum. <laughs> and in that regulatory vacuum, it was actually the social partners themselves through industrial actions and, 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 and strikes and an enormous amount of conflict uh, that established rules and structures and things that, that, that became the, the the, 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 the collective self regulatory. I think there is a lot of path dependency. And I'm going to talk about seven important decisions that were made, or, or, or uh, decisions might be the wrong word, but, but, but seven important pathways that were, were, were taken uh, at different stages in this process. But if, for, for me, and this is connecting back to what you're presenting, is, is that, that any industrial relation system has to walk a very narrow path between two types of authoritarian uh, uh, structures. On the one side, you have the state, 
and the state might be believed uh, in some context that to be a very nice one but if you live in, in, in places like like uh, soviet russia in china in nazi germany the state will not be a fine nice place <laughs> it will be uh, an oppressor an authoritarian state that's the pure pure uh, state regulation on the other hand you have another authoritarian structure and that's the pure market full market structure with, 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 with all of the neoliberal things. And, and, and I think that each country is, is somewhere balancing between these things and, and, and always with a tendency. And the state can also be used to to do to, to, to neoliberal. So so the state is an important uh, thing here. And, and, and what I hear in your presentation, I think that's an important uh, thing is to, to, to understand that, that you can go towards neoliberal, like Australia had done, into in, in that type of, of, I call it authoritarian, it's a strong word, but, but it, it becomes authoritarian. You can also have a, a, a communist system, and, 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 and you can also have a communist system that is, is flirting with, with, with neoliberal ideas, but still remaining, and I think that's a bit of the Vietnam mm -hmm. thing. And then you have strong self-regulatory things with the state, a, a real, and I guess that's Singapore. So what happened in, in, in Sweden was that that path was found, uh, the collective self-regulatory method uh, going forward. And I think what happened was that they, my, the four, 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 four fathers, four mothers, they managed to, to deal with, with what I call the Carl Schmitt trap, how to get out of the, the, the place where, where you as trade unions and employers see each other as enemies, friends or enemies, and, and with all of the conflict that comes out of that. So, but they managed to overcome that. And, and there were two important decisions, I think. One was to, to actually accept each other's existence. It was done in 1906 in Sweden. Uh, and then in 1938, they also agreed on how to deal with the state. To say, we, we, we don't use the state uh, as, as a way of, of, of pushing our, our interests back and forth. So, so, so that was very uh, important. But uh, as I said, all this happened, I think, because trade unions and, and, and employers made very important decisions along the way. And I think one of the first important decisions, and that's why I, I don't just want us to focus on, on the state, it's also very much about what we do as trade unions. So the first thing one they did, uh, I believe, was to form national trade unions, not only at workplaces, but they actually form national a national trade union. They also, in that context, decided that direct democracy is a fantastic thing, but it's not the way to run the trade union. You have to have representativeness, representative trade unions, representative democracy. Secondly, they also decided that one workplace, one union. Very difficult. And I think we're struggling with that everywhere still today, <laughs> that there will be a number of trade unions on just here at the workplace I am, two unions. <laughs> And, 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 and with, with all the shadows, one union, one workplace. That's that's really what one union that bonds. <laughs> Third important uh, choice or, or fundamental decision was to to establish collective agreements that were at the national level. Uh, so 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 you don't get competition between different production sites and different parts of the, the country. Competition works in that. And also to connect those collective agreements with peace clauses so you, you prevent strikes from being happening on, on, on the random, uh, in a random manner. And then fourth, demarcation between different unions, who bargains at what place. Uh, fifth, centralizing decisions on strikes, so, so you can't make a local or individual decision to go on strike. Uh, and, and six, uh, to stick with, with, with collective self-regulation uh, and not get tempted because there will always be temptations to, to enter into the we use the state to 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 push forward your, your interest and, and whatever it is. And then seven, I think also the importance of having a solidaristic wage policy. So this that's that's the Swedish experience and that brought Sweden and, and many Nordic countries into this sphere. And and it was a way to 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 deal this question. But I think it's important because when I listen to you and, and when I read it, I, I, I do think that social partners are, are not only actors, it's, it's also actors or that what we do matters. That's the, the belief I have very strongly uh, being engaged, uh, being 
working as trade unions is that what we do matters. Mm -hmm. So what decisions we make as unions matters. It's not like we're victims of, of, of what the state does or what employers are doing and, and, and all of that. So, so and I think that's empowering. So when I started Hello many, many years ago, the president came to me and said, you know now that you're representing 2 million workers and you can call anyone whenever you want and you act it. You act like that person. I think that's also important to understand that you, you, you represent. And this work I'm having now, I'm representing 40 million workers. So I've been directed to that. So, and, and, and believe in that, uh, that we have that. Power. I think that's, that's an important thing too, coming into this discussion. Anyway, uh, is this as, as a little bit of a, of a background of, of creating the space. So the space is, is made in an interplay, I would say, between what we do ourselves and what we do with employers and, and how we use the, the, the state and, and, and all of that. And that brings me to, a little bit to the second issue, the political freedom uh, uh, for making democracy real, as I understand it. And I totally agree with that, uh, uh, that, that fundamental rights are fundamental. <laughs> In that sense, that it creates the conditions for, 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 for <clears throat> democracy and to make democracy real. And, and here, just this is a bit of a side note, but I think it's important. So when, when I go back and read documents, I'm very uh, fond of that. I, I, it's very clear to me that the early trade union movement here in Europe, and I guess it's, it's probably close to what you get, it's very much a movement for freedom. It's, it's, it's not. It's trade unions are about freedom, and 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 I think it's it's because when 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 at least here in Europe when they got started it was about freedom freedom to to have uh, family life family to 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 have food on the table freedom to 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 have spare time freedom to a lot of things that then developed into uh, equality uh, and, and and fairness and things like that. But but I do think that we are freedom. Movements as well, and, and I think that's that's very important to 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 uh, mention it. But but then, so I, 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 I would like to, to continue your discussions and questions here. But 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 uh, to con but the first thing I, I think one one for bringing it back to Europe is 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 the state uh, and the importance of the state in labor relations uh, and and and. Uh, I think that the, the that one a trade union engages with the state, it's also a false post impact in a way, because the state might also turn against you, because you don't run the state, because there will be political parties if you're in a democracy, and there might even be undemocratic actors. And I think that's connecting to what we are having in Europe right now, the the the, the rise of of, of right wing populism, the far right, and things like that. So of course. What was the giver of, of good things for the trade union it can also be the giver of very negative things for, for, for the trade union. So it, it is a Faust impact. I think that's something we, we, we don't discuss that much here in Europe. But I think the examples you're bringing here is, is, is also uh, putting the importance of that discussion uh, right here in, in, in our lab. And, and it's also about energy in a way, so staying with the, the issue of the state, uh, because of course, if the, the state comes in, we get minimum wage, uh, wages set by, collect, uh, by, by, by laws, we get systems for design collective units and binding, we get most of our uh, employment rights through laws and so on. Of course, it also affects where, where we put our energy as units. Do we put it in the political field or do we put it uh, somewhere else? And 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 and, uh, and 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 I think there we have a lot of differences within Europe too, where, where we put down the energy. Secondly, then uh, I think what one needs to discuss is also it's continuing this, but it's also how we as unions engage with the employers, with the counterparts. How well organized are they? Uh, why are they not better organized? Uh, what can we what can we do to to so if again the Swedish example was that. Trade unions were formed. They made enormous pressure on, on individual employers. Employers understood, I'm in trouble. I better organize as well. So they were organized as a mirror to, to, uh, to, to that. And then I guess, again, going back, I, I, I do think that we, we, we have to put 
our, our trade union face in the mirror. And I do think we do have to ask ourselves about these seven basic fundamental discussions that were taking place in, in Sweden, for example, but also in other places. How do we, 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 we organize ourselves uh, as, as, as unions? But then uh, uh, I can continue for a long time, of course, but, but I do think you're bringing in very important issues here. And that is, of course, the, the issue of migrants coming in and, and, and how to, 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 to act, as in Singapore, similar issues we're having to deal with here in Europe as well. And, and of course, trade as a, as, as a means and a way of, of putting pressure on, on other uh, states. And, and of course, that's the, the, the power we have here in Europe and the European Union is to, to use trade as a means to put pre pressures on others. And, and, and that discussion is on. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, Council. Um, response there, I think, to some of the big questions that you've also posed as well. And thank you for also giving us the Swedish experience and some of the nuances that uh, also... hey, may I, may I just say, Jento, just say, uh, Singapore is nicknamed uh, the Nordic country or yes. the Viking country. Of... <laughs> no, yeah. 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 So, if possible, please, I'd like to open the floor now for questions. I think we already have a couple in the room and also online, if anybody would like to pose any. Yes, this gentleman, please. Thanks. And if you could say who you are and where you're hey, from. Okay, that's quite important. Uh, my name is Paul Lim. I'm a pensioner now. But I used to be a university professor. And I'm originally from Singapore. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I came. Mm -hmm. um, from a theoretical point of view, I, I discovered that this theory of corporatism is still quite important. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you this. In my younger days, I was a labor activist in Singapore. I had to leave Singapore after being interrogated by the police. Mm -hmm. right. I came to Belgium, I became a political refugee. Mm -hmm. Now, the last strikes, the last strikes in Singapore took place in the 1970s when I was there. The last strikes. Yes. Okay. Yes. In the Singapore law, yes. strike is recognized mm. as a right. In practice, it is not. Mm. Because the role of the trade unions is to control the workers. Absolutely. And I was trying to organize workers with my team, with others in my team, to organize a trade union, independent of the state trade union, and we were slashed, oh, yeah. we were suppressed. Huh. Okay? And I want to say, whatever success Singapore has today is a result of suppression of political rights in Singapore. Yeah. Right? The trade office, if you want material progress, success, no rights, we decide for you. The social contract was imposed. It was never discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it is important. I think <laughs> knowing the, his, the history of Singapore is very important. Mm -hmm. Explain mm -hmm. what it is today, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever you say to me, nothing, nothing, I don't see any much changes. Things are things mm -hmm. are the same. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely yes. Um, yeah. I first learned about Singapore with um, a colleague mm -hmm. called uh, Chris Leggett. Yeah, we used to be uh, at the university, the National University of Singapore. He's a good mate of mine. Yeah, and, and himself uh, has uh, there to cover yeah. uh, the strike that it was not a strike, but that's actually a uh, 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 work tool by uh, pilots at Singapore Airlines in the early eighties, and uh, they were actually Australians. Mm -hmm. And um, well, he he he, he did uh, cover this this uh, to the Singapore media. He was arrested. Uh, uh, lucky he could escape Singapore. He has been banned to Singapore since. Yeah, I, I cannot go back to Singapore. Yeah, yeah. That's I have a, I have a warrant arrest against against me. That's still standing. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, it's, what what would be a very yeah, that, I, I totally agree with what you say. Yeah. And, and also, um, well, things have relaxed a bit since, uh, but there's no total freedom, that's, that's for sure. Uh, I'm myself very careful about what I say and what I write. 
right? Um, and, and, and like, you know, housing was at the base, uh, and you are absolutely right, Peter, you, you need to come back to the early times of the foundation of Singapore, explains a lot. Yeah. And, and, and the subversion of also the communist factions and things like that, because you don't so uh, uh, you know that better than me. Okay. And, and but the, the point is that the housing system, public housing, that was one of the pillars of, of, of mm -hmm. um, uh, the PAP policies. They still control people and also manage manage the social cohesion and, uh, and multiculturalism through the housing system. But also, uh, that's a way to get a great on uh, uh, elections and, and you know uh, and keep the, the electoral system that is. It's very tight, neat. Eighty-five percent of Singaporeans live in public housing. Yeah. Eighty-five percent. Okay. And how they do it? They pass a land acquisition law in which all private lands were just were taken away. On that note, we have quite a key question that's come in from somebody who's online. Yeah. Um, and this is Vera Dos Santos Costa. Welcome to you, Vera, from the ILO. Yeah. And um, keeping with the Singaporean question, if you like, she asks, even if Stefan rightly suggests that their model is not easily copyable for, uh, to other uh, countries, I guess, um, at the global level, we have to admit that a lot of countries are very closely looking at their developments, mm. certainly the ones on their new law act for platform workers, creating a new category of workers. And she asks, wouldn't that be regarding the new forms of work a possible disruptive influence for Europe? So key question there, I think. Um. Oh, no, I'm going to put together. together yes. <laughs> Thanks for the, this question. Um, my answer would be very quick, I guess. Um, uh, is that they they are very proactive in terms of uh, policy, and that's the reason why I insisted on you know, uh, everything about around human resource uh, development or human capital development. I mean, um, and uh, and they want to be a regional a hub. For a, um, um, uh, regional development, uh, and so they they're very active and, and agile in terms of uh, uh, of um, industrial policies. So they can they can be um, uh, they can be a source of inspiration in this respect. But knowing that it does perhaps it does work in Singapore because of the system being agile and being one, <laughs> uh, and, and not um, no this. As I explained, it's, it's a one single entity basically div divided in three heads. Mm -hmm. No, it's a gorgon. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think so. Uh, and um, uh, uh, likewise, uh, uh, they're so much obs obsessed by uh, social cohesion. Uh, they, they don't like um, to have things out of control. Just a fun. Uh, Lorenza Monaco, uh, University College London. Uh, so I, I'll be very fast, and then you take what you want to take. So I have one question is on Australia, and uh, I find it interesting what you highlighted that there's uh, increasing uh, strong casualization. We know that casualization may mean different things in different contexts. So I was wondering if you could explain a bit more of where it happens, so in what sectors, and what is exactly uh, the difference between casualized workers and non-casual workers. One question. Another short point. One is I find this uh, research agenda on independent organization, IEOs in Vietnam, very interesting. Uh, and you seem to suggest that, that this is a kind of top-down initiative from capital side to, to in a sort of liberalize the, the union environment and detach it from the strong control of the Communist Party, probably. Uh, but my question is where they're given all the strikes that you mentioned, where there are other initiatives more like bottom up in terms of organizing independently from the existing unions that are controlled or need to re report to the Communist Party. Last comment, research, pure research based. I mean, the comparative exercise between these countries is, of course, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's always difficult to compare, but above all, uh, 
countries, not only there are uh, different in income levels, but there are on very different stages in industrial development. Mm. I mean, Australia can be included within the industrializing countries. Singapore is, a, I would say, high road industrializing country. Uh, Vietnam, a bit of lower road so far mm. because it com competed with the lower labor costs. Mm. How mm. do you, I mean, this is not to solve the problem, but to take into account that the state and the unions react to different environments, mm -hmm. also in the way they are more defensive or not. Mm -hmm. If they need to save an industry or they need to compete for FDIs in the in the Vietnam case. So it's a complex picture, but good luck. I'm curious to read it when you... <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'll start by the end with Vietnam. Uh, the story is, is easy. It's a multinational corporation telling the, the, the communist government do something. It's a mess. Uh, no, it's out of control. And, and uh, the Vietnamese co uh, government are all at the same time being pushed by external forces like the FBI. Uh, and, and so they say, well, okay, let, let, let's, let's get those guys to be, uh, to, to, be allowed to organize and perhaps we're gonna get more control over them <clears throat> and at the same time telling the unions do you do your job guys do your job uh when the unions have been they, but in the past they, they were uh they were uh, assisting um uh, the cab of the you um, know i mean the, the, in, in a state-owned enterprise and then there's a switch you now the assisting management hr you know just the, the so they're not used, uh, but there's pressure from the top to the, the, uh, the official trade unions to do more work, and they have done so apparently, uh, according to my colleague, in, in relation to health and safety, and, and uh, organization, uh, um, I mean, workplace uh, direct immediate issues, but still, um, it's it pressure from international corporations to the uh, uh, Vietnamese government do something to fix the mess. And it's not coming from the workers themselves. Uh, and as I said, they don't, they don't have an interest to do so. Actually. It works for them. Three days, two days, and it's usually it's one day's right. And the, the, the other thing that I didn't mention that is they are able to coordinate uh, across districts, which is very important for the, the leverage. There's, there's no point to do strike there if the guys just put the order to the next place. So they are able to coordinate at, at district level but the new legislation would prevent them to do so if they were officialized uh, as employee organization. Uh, so, so I said that in the detail, I read the, the, the legislation in detail. If you look at the details, they make their life impossible, uh, as in Australia. Uh, and going back to Australia, we are in a situation now that they, we've got this uh, legislation that allows to get uh, casuals to be turned into permanent casuals. Permanent casual. Yeah, that's a legislation. Sorry, to what? Sorry. We turn into permanent casual. <laughs> I don't understand. It's a casual working. A casual worker. Okay. Yeah, but you're permanent casual. Permanent casual. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's visual. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my ear, my hearing. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, myself too. You know, <laughs> you're not the only one. Um, you're not the only one being confused there. And, and uh, when they when they put that legislation in. Um, the first to try to get the status as permanent casuals mm -hmm. were in the university system because the tertiary education system is the champion. Uh, we're running basically at or three quarter of casual uh, employees, you know, uh, uh, especially in teaching, casual teachers, academics. So they, what, what, what does it mean? Uh, you, you're on contract. You're on contract, that's it, end of a contract, bye bye. So in Australia, when you're casual, you, you lose all your entertainment. No holidays, nothing. Touch months, yeah. yeah. All the all the entertainments disappear. And to compensate you for having lost everything, you there is a casual loading of 25%. So you pay 25% more, that no holidays, nothing. nothing. Okay. Uh, and um, that is when you, you contract an employer. Uh, but um, then you can be a, you can be an independent contractor as well, and that's 
like uh, like a half basically half the workforce, and was was pushed by the liberals, being your boss, you know, right. but, and the way they attract the guys into that thing is, is uh, tax. Because you can deduce your units, you can deduce uh, everything. All the costs related to your business can be deduced from tax. So, uh, so then it's a mess. Then uh, all the attrition, um, a lot of, um, I mean, construction workers and you know, plumbers and <laughs> uh, uh, the labor market. And, and in some sites, you don't know who is working for whom. Stefan, could I perhaps interject and we could take one last question before we wrap up yeah. at two, but also the political economy variety that you mentioned, very critical point there. I, I feel another discussion coming on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But last question, perhaps, Philippe, we'll give you the floor if that's all right. And then if there are follow-up questions, um, we'll, we'll think of a way to integrate them into the session. Okay, it's perhaps more a reflection uh, about well, what can we learn from Europe and yeah. thinking from what you say at different points of view. And what you uh, present to us is change. Systems that, that are moving and changing, which is also the question from Europe and from the trade union. How you change, you rebalance, modify it, so the system. And what we can learn from your story, or I, uh, at least what I learned, is the first one from Australia, which is a very complex system. I was yeah. there for one year and then tried to understand mm -hmm. 20 years ago. But it's rather simple because it is about you spoke about politics, left, right, and institutions. You have to have the institution. The second case, you have still the kind of system which is working, but you have a kind of external layer which is not integrated in the, in the system, which is the migrant. And there, what you present is no solution in a way. The solution is we expel the migrant, and there is no problem because we return to the pure. Singaporean community and social contract, which is okay, that's perhaps a solution, but it's a radical solution and perhaps uh, more probably will not happen. And I think that's also a change. Or you integrate at the margin of the system something which doesn't fit with the, with the system, and the Singaporean case is perhaps the most extreme because you refuse to. And the last one, I think, is. Or are the external uh, influence uh, and, and uh, what you know, perhaps you are not so sure that the, the, the power of the multinational uh, company to, to change the system, but uh, basically that's the story. Some someone external change your system, and you have some movement, but rather weak. So I think that's also a way of looking to the case because I think to compare is very difficult. Uh, but to, to learn all we, all we can think, what we can learn from different mm -hmm. systems and all the change and what we can take from that mm -hmm. and what is completely different, which is interesting. And uh, that's, that's not the question. Yes, yeah, so, oh, so, so, I'll take on the comments and I'll come good. back to, yeah. uh, to what was said before. It's just, there's a common thread there. Uh, if you look at Australia, uh, changes where basically the BCA, the uh, Business Council of Australia agenda, and the BCA is the big enterprises, the top, like top 100, whatever. They all multinational corporations and, uh, and, and uh, in a large proportion from their American com companies. The system has never been challenged by Australian Chamber of Commerce and Employee Association, ever. This is the, 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 uh, the liberal agenda was the wish list, and you can look at, uh, at the documents from the early 90s, the wish list of the BCA which is not an Australian-based employee association at the end of the day. It's international capital. Uh, Singapore, I, 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 what they say is that, well, they will have to accommodate their uh, tight-knit system uh, and cronies them to, to kind of uh, more, more and more Chinese influence and capital investments and things like that. It might, it might create some, uh, uh, yeah, some kind of, uh, but even, the majority of the population in Singapore is from uh, Chinese descent, but they will have to deal with that. Uh, and, and well, and you said it. Going back to the state, the pressure on the, on the communist state uh, in Vietnam is coming from also international capital or and international labor agencies uh, to some extent. So it, I think the, the looking at the state, uh, how the state is reacting to different kind of pressure. Is a good thread for comparative analysis. It's a solid one. Thank you.
Thank you very much. <laughs> and on that solid note, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much, Stefan, for your wonderful um, speech. And yeah. Well, I've I, I had to speak down. fast. I don't like I know, it. But okay. it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. We'll slow down the recording. Um, Klaus Mikhail, <laughs> thank you also for your comments and um, for expanding the debate um, to Bart for facilitating this event and also to Maria for her superb organizing as well. Thank you everybody for coming and we hope to see you at um, subsequent events. Thank you. Thank you.